Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all tonight. I'm confident I don't need this, but I will use it anyway. I've been known as a loudmouth around the house for quite a few years, and I'm sure to some of you that's nothing new. Please open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'd like to thank you all for inviting me here tonight. Some of you I have known for quite a few years, others of you I have seen and do not remember your names, but I'm glad that you're here tonight because I'm certain, I'm certain there's a whole lot of things that y'all could be doing tonight besides coming here and listening to some fella from Porter County. But I hope that the words that we share tonight and ponder tonight will help us to truly consider the focus of our faith, the focus of our religion. While I have been preaching for a while, one of the things that stands out to me in my studies and in my thoughts and in my ponderings of the grace of God is just how incredible the cross is. And I want you to think tonight as we go through both of these lessons, we sing in America and in Western civilization, sometimes the song of the old rugged cross and how I will cherish the old rugged cross. And I want you to ponder just how paradoxical that is. A brother of mine who has since gone told me one time, he says, Mark, I can't sing that song. And I look, I said, why? Why can't you sing that song? He said, that would be like a Jew saying, I cling to the gas chamber. And I I thought, wow. That's a kind of a far-ranging blurb there, isn't it? Isn't that kind of out there a little bit? But then the more I thought about it, I understood his point. Even though I didn't completely agree with it. And then when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now think about holding up the cross, holding up the means of execution in the Roman world as the message. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I preach the cross. That's just a hint of paradox in that. There's a hint of, oh, so you want me to come and be with you guys when you're holding up the fact that God was willing to die on a cross for you? Well, The grandeur and the glory of the preaching of the gospel is the fact that they didn't run away from it. They didn't run away from the cross. In fact, it was a cross-centered religion. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now, sometimes in our daily conversations we talk, oh, God's smarter than us. But how many of us really think that? We think we're pretty smart. Just like the Romans probably did. The Greeks thought they were pretty smart. The Egyptians thought they were pretty smart. I mean, in 21st century Western civilization, we got the tiger by the tail, folks. And yet, how smart are we? Now, I know inside a church building, it's probably cool to say, no, we're not very smart. But yeah, we really think we are. But it's not until we humble ourselves before the cross that we try to find the wisdom in the cross. And one of the worries that I have in my life and in my preaching and in my teaching and in my relationships with so many folks is that, and I'm stealing this phrase, and I don't remember who I stole it from, that's the one way to be original, is that we've almost vaccinated ourselves against the cross. You know, vaccines has been kind of on Fox News a lot and even on MSNBC. I mean, can you imagine? Both on the same page. But a vaccine, the way it normally works, and I'm by no means a medical doctor, is they give you a little bit of the disease so that you build up an antibody against it. I'm afraid that we've had just enough of the cross in our years and in our faith and in our Bible study and in our singing and in our reading that maybe it just doesn't hold the place that it ought to in our thoughts, in our prayers, in our worship. 
And when Bill called me and asked me to do this, I said, well, let's, let's get back into the cross. Let's not be ashamed of it. Because there are religions around that are centered on a whole bunch of things. And once your way to build up a church <clears throat> is to offer people what they want. Give them what they want. Who wants the cross? Now I know when, when we're waving our hands and we're getting all filled up with emotion. And I love emotion. And you may see some out of me tonight. If you don't know me tonight, you know, your ears may, there may be some ringing in the ears. Because you can't talk about the cross without feeling. And brothers and sisters, sometimes in our tradition we have wandered far away from the emotion of the paradox of the fact that the God of the universe, the creator of all time, offered himself to die a horrific death on the cross so that we might be saved. And if that doesn't, if, if that doesn't cause a stirring up inside of us, then there's something wrong with us. Especially those of us who say we claim him as our king. So I will cling to that old rugged cross. Because it's my only hope. It's your only hope. It's our only hope. It is foolishness. It's moronic. It's a stumbling block. That's what he continues here in verses 22, 23, and 24. The Jews ran away from the cross, those who tried to find some conventional wisdom in it. The Greeks looked at it and said, that's moronic. That's, that doesn't make any sense at all to me, that God would die on a cross. But what is so precious to the true believer is just that very thing. The cross of Christ. And you can follow along in the outline if you want to, or you can just listen and follow along in your Bibles with me as we look at some things that centers around the cross. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 first. Redemption centers on the cross. Now, of course you know that. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time at all, even most folks don't even who aren't even Christians, understand that in the Christian religion, redemption, salvation centers on the cross. But let's spend some time thinking about this. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus the Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The blood redeems us. We don't need to be vaccinated away from that gory sight. Because it was because of that sacrifice, it was because of that, that we can be redeemed. That we can be forgiven. Our forgiveness does not come because we are baptized, brothers and sisters. It comes by the grace of God and His willingness to shed His blood for us. And He connected that blood to our baptism. I'm not saying don't get baptized. I'm not saying don't believe. I'm saying without the cross, without His blood, and without His resurrection, a bunch of folks just be getting wet. Our redemption is in the cross, is in the blood. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. The cross allows us to be, to be restored back to God. To be redeemed and restored back. To have fellowship with Him again. 1 John chapter 1 verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. We're not just spared eternal punishment. You see, our redemption shouldn't be, we shouldn't run to Jesus just because we want to get away from the consequences of our sins. Now, we want to get away from them. But we shouldn't just be coming to Jesus just because we want to escape the consequences of our sin. We want to run to Jesus because we want to be with Him. Amen. 
Because we love Him. Because we commit ourselves to Him. Because we want to have fellowship with Him. We want to have something in common with Him. And we realize what we have in common is due to His grace. It's not to what we have done. It's not to anything that we have accomplished. It's what He has done. And we make the wise, smart, faithful decision to run to Him. Romans chapter 6 illustrates the baptism where the blood was shed. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Paul spends an inordinate amount of time. And what, what's funny to me is he's explaining this to folks that have already done it. Romans 6 wasn't written to folks who don't believe in baptism. Romans 6 was written to folks who had already been baptized. So Christian, it's, this is something we need to understand. Not only in precept and in understanding before, but also through our lives. That it is because of His death, burial, and resurrection. It is because of the cross that our baptism makes any sense at all. <laughs> if you could say that. I mean, have you, have you thought about baptism making sense? I mean, it makes sense with Romans 6. I understand. We're buried, verse 4, we are buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Dead, buried, resurrected. Dead to sin, buried in the water, raised up, made alive in the Spirit and forgiven of our sins. That, that makes no sense to me at all. Other than the fact that God said it. And so many people argue about it. As if, as if folks who, who teach the Bible teach baptismal regeneration. Baptismal re We're regenerated in the Spirit. We're regenerated because of His grace. We're made alive again because we have yielded to Him. There's nothing magical about the water. There's nothing magical about the and I'm going to use a phrase here to be provocative, about the incantation. Have you ever heard folks argue about what the preacher says before they dunk you? Well, is it in the name of Jesus or is it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? How about Yes. Because they're both biblical. But it's not the, fact, it's not the incantation. It's not even the folks that do it. It's the answer of a good heart to God because of the cross. The blood that Jesus shed on... My brother's here tonight. Keith, he called me a brother from a different mother. I would say amen to that. You remember that one night we went over to Cherville and we watched that awful movie? I don't often suggest folks watch rated R movies. But Keith and Calvin and I went over to Cherville and we watched The Passion of the Christ. And you could easily pinpoint a lot of things that they got wrong in that, but one thing that I still remember to this day, and I haven't watched it again yet, was the horrific nature of that crucifixion. And he did it because of us. And every time now that I partake of the Lord's Supper, I have a visual that sometimes I wish I didn't have. Because our observance on Sundays in the communion is about the cross. And what draws us together. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now what's interesting is Paul, Paul really didn't need to tell Roman folks. I realize it's Corinthians, but it, this is Roman culture. He didn't need to tell Roman folks about crucifixion. Have you ever noticed even in the gospel accounts, there's not really a lot of, I'll use one of my wife's words, sparkle words. My wife teaches writing in elementary schools and she tells kids in their writing to, to use adjectives, to use adverbs, to, to use things that help the person see in their mind what's going on. The gospel accounts don't use a whole lot of sparkle words. It says, and he was crucified because they all knew very well what that meant. And it wasn't pretty. And I guarantee you, nobody was walking around in the first century with a cross around their neck or on their bracelet, or on a church sign, or on anything. Because that's really not something that you wanted to do. Except the one who got up on that cross and could have gotten off of that cross if he'd have wanted to said, take up your cross and follow me and remember me. Thus remember me. 
the song says. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he tells them how to do it. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that on the same night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Okay, think about this. In the first century, you're proclaiming victory or defeat? And the answer is yes. You're proclaiming the cross? Why would anybody in their right mind proclaim the cross? Now see, 2,000 years later, we're inoculated against the horrific nature of the cross. So yeah, we talk about the cross, the cross, the cross. You know, we got folks genuflecting to doing all cross, the cross. Nobody, nobody was, no. Because it was too awful. Except he said, remember me. Thus, remember me. That's why, that's why on Sundays, when Christians gather, they don't gather to show off their clothes. They don't gather to show off their grandbabies. They don't gather to go out and eat. They gather to remember and to praise the one who was willing to do that for us. Our remembrance centers on that and we need to remember that and not vaccinate ourselves against it. So on Sunday morning when it comes time, maybe I've been critical every once in a while about the remembrance and what we say. And I think, you know, there are other passages other than 1 Corinthians 11 that we could talk about. But that's a me problem. That's not, that's not the problem of the fellow that's leading. If I'm vaccinating myself, if, if, if we're saying the same thing over and over again, maybe I need to get the message over and over and over again instead of being critical of the one who is trying to help me frame my mind around why we're here on Sundays. Instead of expecting it to be about me. It's not about me. It's about Him. Because He's the one that got up there. Our observance centers around the cross. And in fact... As a body, that one body, turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Paul, as he's about ready to depart from Ephesus, and he's probably pretty sure he's never going to see these people ever again, speaks to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. He calls them together, and notice in verse 28. Acts chapter 20, and in verse 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Paul is ready to depart from Ephesus and he's going to leave and he calls the elders together and the point is simple. He says the church that you are shepherding, that you are pastoring right now, isn't yours. You didn't buy it. You didn't die for it. It's someone else's. And you know what, folks? There'd probably be a whole lot less church trouble if everybody, pastors all the way down, remembered who died for the church, and it ain't us. Bad grammar for emphasis' sake. There ain't nobody from Valpo here, honey, tonight except you and me, so I can get away with it. The point is simple and clear. The church was bought and paid for by the shed blood of the one who never sinned. And as his blood bought people, as his blood brought people, what that teaches us is we mean a lot to him. And that's something we need to get across to folks. Because in the, the richest, most information laden country in the world, people today are dumb when it, comes to, when it comes to understanding Jesus. They're ignorant. They don't know what he's about because there's so many fakes out there. Jesus just wants me to feel this way. Jesus just wants me to have this way. Jesus, this, Jesus wants me, wants me, what? He wants me to understand the price that was paid. 
so that I could be redeemed. And to love Him. I'm getting into the other lesson. The message of the cross should not be suppressed by games. If it elicits emotion, it should be accepted and embraced. But it's not about emotion. The message of the cross is submission and death and value and resurrection. It's everything to us, His people. When you think of the church, think of people. Don't think of organizations. Don't think of directories. Think of your neighbor in the pew. Think of your brothers and sisters as your family. Think of the willingness that Jesus had in order to redeem us from our sins. Because it's about relationship. The church is a relationship that most folks in the world don't get. To most folks, relationships are transactions. Retweeting, favoriting, hashtag white and gold, right? It wasn't black and blue, it was white and gold. I mean, that's what, that's what the world is. I'm on this team, I'm on that team. Yeah, I did a hashtag. Believe it or not, I know I'm not cool, but I try. We, that's what, to the world, that's what, and some, some of the older folks, guys, some of the older folks are going, what is he talking about? <laughs> but in this world, it's a transaction. You show up, you pay your price, you eat your dinner, you wave your hand, you, you tweet, you retweet, you favorite, you have a friend, somebody follows you. It's all about it. The church isn't a transaction. There was one. The gospel grew out of the cross and it was shameful to others as we looked at earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It was shameful that folks would talk like that. That's not a, that's not a word folks use much today, is it? When it comes to our observing the Lord's Supper, when it comes to our understanding the church, don't ever take the cross out of it. As painful as it is, as horrifying as it is, as challenging as it is, the cross is the center. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to get a little preacher on you next. When you study with folks and they have some understanding of the Bible, one of the things that most folks really don't understand is the separation of covenants. While He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever, there is a difference in the way that believers and faithful have worshipped God through the years. Well, the ultimate divide in human history came at the cross. And you know what's funny is until recently... We even had a calendar based on Jesus. The Latin phrase, acronym for A.D. was the year of our Lord. We recognized that in Western civilization for a long time until a bunch of fancy pants liberals got involved in it and now we just call it the current era. Everybody who knows, knows it's, we're talking the year of our Lord because they didn't change the numbers. They just changed the acronym at the end of it. The cross separates time. It separates the covenants. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, And you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. One of the things that is clear from Paul writing to these people is, it, the law was nailed to the cross. It's a dividing line in history. The law was meant to be temporary. Which was words for fighting. Galatians 3 and 19 says, there's no longer need for a tutor once the fullness has come. Christ will, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9, verses 16 and 17, you say, I'm thinking I'm following that line pretty closely, said that Christ's will could not go into effect until His death. And when we read and we understand that Christ was the new lawgiver, 
The cross divides the two covenants so that, but yeah, didn't they say back there in the Psalms to do something? Well, it helps us understand that there's a dividing line there. He's the same God. He didn't all of a sudden kind of wake up and change his mind. He's no, he's no different, but we're under a different set of rules now. And understanding the cross will help us understand what God expects out of us. I don't have linen on tonight, and I'm from the wrong tribe anyway. We aren't lighting candles or lamps. We aren't sacrificing animals. Why not? There's a lot of things that was done in the Old Testament that's not practiced by New Testament folks today because of the cross. And it will help us understand it when we understand the cross. You see, the cross is the center. Wait. Is somebody preaching a lesson about the centering of the cross in our faith and religion? This is, this is what it's all about. And if we'll come to understand it more and more and focus on it more and more in our preaching, in our teaching, in our understanding, then we will grasp who Jesus is. He's not just a dude. We'll understand who the church is. We'll understand why we do things. Because the authority lies not only in the fact that He is deity, but as deity, He took upon Himself the cross and has earned our respect. He has earned what we offer to Him in worship. Turn with me back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. This episode with the teacher of Israel and Jesus in John chapter 3 is fascinating to me. And one of the things that dawned upon me a few years ago is instead of being critical of Nicodemus, I'm going to give him a little grace because I would have had more questions than Nicodemus had the guts to ask that night. Because if somebody told me you must be born again, I'd have been in the same quandary he was in. Wouldn't you? I mean, think about it. Some guy who's been working miracles and you come to him, maybe at night because you're a little hesitant, or maybe, you know, maybe he was busy all day. I don't know. But he comes to him and Jesus says, you must be born again. How many of us are going to take that literally, physically, literally? Every one of us. You know why? Because that's how we roll. We're going to listen to him and go, huh? Or... Really? Or SMH? Because getting this is difficult. It's difficult to, t to shape our perspective away from what we've always known and what we've always expected and to turn it to looking at it a different way. And that's exactly the point that Jesus makes to Nicodemus. Let's go back a little bit earlier in the passage. Nicodemus, after... Jesus explains a little bit in verse 9. He asks the question, how can these things be? In other words, I wasn't expecting this. You see, from our part, we know the rest of the story, Mr. Harvey. We, we know the rest of the story. But let's not, let's not lose the story here and the impact that it's having on Nicodemus. Because Jesus continues. And he continues with a little bit of an upbraid in verse 10. Are you the teacher of Israel and know not these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you, do, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in the heavens. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now think about that for a minute. Lifted up. Every good Israelite would understand the bronze serpent, Nehushtan, was lifted up at the speaking of God. 
This wasn't something that Moses just figured out. God said, fashion a bronze serpent, put it up on a staff, and whoever looks upon it will be healed from the bites of the fiery serpents in the wilderness. They remembered that story. Unfortunately, they, if they knew the rest of the story about how he became an idol later on, they would be ashamed. But there is obvious imagery here. I have two sons. Both of them are teaching literature now. That's something else. Can I have a minute? Don't run away from the literature of the Bible, folks. Don't run away from the imagery because it's all there adding more meat on the bone. Here is an imagery that a Jew would get. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Lifted up. Wait a second. Hushtag. Lifted up. And if you look upon Him and believe, and why would they believe? Because God said so. The Son of Man must be lifted up. We know our Lord was lifted up. And we know we must believe. Just as those Israelites must have believed in the Word of God to look upon the serpent. And when they looked upon Him, was that work? Or was it grace? It was faith. Because God said do it. And it didn't make any sense. But by God's grace, they were healed. And so when we get to verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. When we get to verse 16, we go, yeah, I know verse 16. I've known that since I was three. Vaccinated against John 3.16. That's what happens to us a lot, folks. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. I use the term one and only on purpose here because the Lord has many sons. But like Abraham... God told Abraham, take your only son, Isaac. Abraham had more than one son. Just like Isaac is a type to us, Jesus is of the same type. For God so loved the world that He gave the only son of His kind that we might have eternal life if we will believe. Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross of Calvary and anyone who has the venom of sin in them when looking upon Him in faith and trust We'll be freed. We'll be freed from that venom. We'll be cleansed of that disease when we are willing to look upon the Lord. Folks, don't run away from John 3.16 because it doesn't have the whole gospel plan of action. Preach it and teach it and tell folks what it really means. Because of the blood that was shed on the cross, the power to heal is evident. Our salvation centers on the cross. There was a time when I thought blood was yucky. I still do. You know, because after all, we like our chicken boneless and skinless and under cellophane, right? But I remember one time when I understood how effective blood was at cleansing. A blood pressure cuff was put on my arm in high school. And it was put on pretty tight, and they pumped it up. And then the biology teacher said, Mark... And to the rest of us that had on, squeeze your hand. And so I started squeezing my hand. And all of a sudden there was pain in, from just the squeezing of my hand because of the lactic acid inside my, inside my muscles and things weren't being taken out because the blood wasn't circulating through my hand. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, and the rest of us were looking at each other like, I don't want to do this anymore. And then he took the blood pressure cuff off and immediately there was an easing of the pain. And my eyes opened up. I'm like, how'd that work? Because he was teaching how necessary blood was. 2,000 years ago, they didn't know about the cleansing nature of blood, or did they? They knew about it 3,500 years ago when the Lord told them from Sinai how to cleanse the tabernacle, how to cleanse for sin. The Hebrew writer tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no cleansing. We now know medically what they knew because God told them that 3,500 years ago. The blood of the Christ 
The Messiah of Israel was shed so that we could be cleansed, saved from our sin. For too many people today, the cross is a cute idea. Turn with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's a nice sentiment for Sunday. It's a nice reason to get a necklace. And please, if you have one on tonight, I'm not saying you're going to hell. I don't think you have an icon around your neck. Please don't go away thinking that. I have to hedge some of my more bold statements every once in a while because I don't want you running away from me just because you think I'm preaching at you. But it's more than a cute idea. It's more than a logo. It's more than a sentiment. Let's take the time and read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning in verse 18 again. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For as it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. To those of us who really love the Lord, we've come to appreciate just how much the Lord must love us. What a blessing it is to be called the children of God. Because we know the price. A few years ago, a box came to the house. And I didn't know what it was. I hadn't ordered anything. And Cindy came in and she was grinning. And she said, open it. Cool. What is it? Well, I began to open it. And inside there was this baseball. And I coached baseball for almost 15 years. I had baseballs all over the place. Sometimes places Cindy didn't want them. Baseball's in the garage, baseball's in the car, smelled like baseball in the car. Well, I opened it up. Well, on this baseball, there was a name, a signature. Johnny Bench, Hall of Fame, whatever year it was. And I had mentioned in passing that Johnny Bench was the, my favorite baseball player of my youth. Being born in central Kentucky, you know, it's, it probably took about as long to get, to get to Riverfront as it does to get to Wrigley Field from here. But it was a long way, but that was my team. He was my guy. And my wife bought me that present. And I treasured that ball. Now, unlike the Sandlot, my boys knew better than to go get the baseball with the signature on it and go play with it because we had tons of them in the garage because they knew that meant something to me it wasn't the fact even as much as that Johnny Bench signed it it was the fact that that gift was purchased specifically for me it doesn't mean a thing at all to you some of you probably don't John, who's Johnny Bench who's that I'm telling that story not just to waste time but when you think about the gifts that have been given you that have been personal and mean something, when you extrapolate that out to thinking about the creator of the universe sent his son for the specific reason to die on the cross. And while John 3.16 says the world, let's make it more personal. He died there for me. He died there so that I could understand how valuable I am to God. And God doesn't want me to be in hell. He wants me to be in heaven with Him. Which is why, folks, we need to understand and embrace the cross. Not because Jesus was butchered on it, which He was. 
But because of the debt of sin that I could do nothing about, He was willing to take up on Himself. Let's not be vaccinated against that. Let's, let's relish that. Let's praise Him for it. Let's embrace it. And tell the world about it. Thank you for your attention.